Welcome viewers to MOOC's online course on visual perception and art, a survey across the cultures. This is the fourth lecture and the topic of this lecture is visual perception and creativity part 1. Now it is needless to say that any kind of visual perception involves a certain standard stages like reception which is uh, when the eye senses a stimulus followed by transduction when uh, it changes so that the brain can understand it followed by transmission because then that visual sensation is sent to the visual cortex followed by selection where aspects selected of stimulus followed by organization where grouping of elements to form a whole and finally followed by very very significant stage at the end which is called interpretation when a meaning is given and the meaning is also constructed through this process of visual perception and that is one of the reasons why in a drawing like this which we have already seen we know that it does make a sense in spite of the fact that this human figure, this drawing of the human figure, this image of the human figure does not have a head. In fact, it does not bother us. We are not at all disturbed by the absence of this head simply because our brain fills up the gap of this absence. Though the head has not been physically drawn by the artist, but we the viewers can almost see it as it were in our mind. Now this is not exactly only about imagination, not just that we are imagining that the head is there, it is a part of the process of visual perception, partly due to the memory partly due to the assumption, partly due to the process of inference that we have already referred to. And that is why in a painting like this by Sura, despite the fact that many of the details have not been physically or really painted or drawn, it does not really stop us from seeing them. So there is a paradox, it has not been drawn, but we can see how it is possible? It is possible because once again of the very very complex process that the visual perception involves. For example, look at this very simple diagram which exemplifies the theory of illusory contours. Now, there is no such contour line to clearly demarcate a wide triangle that all of us can see in this diagram. It is almost impossible to, to, to avoid uh, the, any, any possibility of um, seeing it. I mean you cannot say that no, I have not been able to see the diagram. It is impossible to have, it is so obvious yet that wide triangle actually does not exist in this drawing. It does, it does exist only as an illusion. So this figure ground illusory contours uh, have often been used by the artists. So when you are doing a work of art, when you are doing a painting and drawing, it is really not necessary that you have to go on to show all the necessary details. You have this freedom to suggest something by not showing it, yet the viewers will be able to see it. It sounds paradoxical, it sounds very contradictory, but believe me this is how it works as this simple diagram demonstrates. So this illusory contours have this peculiar process of empowering us, the viewers, to see things which are not there, but suggested nevertheless. So we perceive an object as a whole 
despite it being actually incomplete. We group the individual elements to make one by filling in the missing contour lines so that it makes sense. So, look at these two diagrams and see how you can see a lot of things a pattern, a square, though in between certain portions of this pattern and square has not been shown, but in our mind we fill in the gap, we continue with our imagination and complete what is not complete in the actual drawing. Now, when you look at a work of art like this, it is a Japanese uh, drawing uh, where you can see storks, birds in different positions and movements. Now, apparently the pictorial ground is completely neutral because there is no suggestion or no sign which characterizes the pictorial ground whether it is grass or whatever, whether it has a depth or not, it is a flat neutral pictorial ground. But the positions and movements of the storks create a sense of space and give us the scope of interpreting it in meaningful way. Now, so it is a very very deliberate choice not to show anything else in the ground. It is a deliberate idea to leave the ground neutral to enable the viewers to imagine and to help us to imagine what we are supposed to imagine the positive forms in this case the birds in different movements and positions, they actually guide us, I mean our brains in a very significant way. And this is a fantastic example of how our brain works in order to complete an incomplete drawing. For example, this is a drawing of cat, but how do we understand this is a drawing of a cat? Because it is barely the tail and one ear and little bit of left side of the body, the contour line that is what has been really drawn, rest has been kept completely blank. But this is how our brain works in the context of visual perception that our brain completes the entire drawing, whatever is remaining absent is completed by our brain through the process of visual perception. So, visual perception as I have told you right at the outset is not a passive process, it is an active process where you also take part in reconstructing your visual experience. So, a lot of commercial logos and symbols thrive on this principle. For example, closure is a very important principle of visual perception which implies that if we have a large pattern with missing components, we tend to fill in the missing parts to create the image we actually see. So, this logo of a panda has of course, some suggestions of black shapes, but then it is left up to us to imagine and complete the rest of the portions of the form. Now, these principles are frequently used to create logos, symbols, signs and communication codes in real life. So, once again you look at this diagram and you figure out that how even if you try very hard not to do, but you are bound to complete the missing links and complete the diagram. A diagram which has not been actually shown, but suggested by leaving certain white portions, white lines against black shapes. So, this is exactly how we tend to continue and connect the invisible lines. Even in highly realistic paintings like this, which appear to be very easily understandable to us only because certain principles of visual perception are at work. For example, when you look at this painting, which is a very very realistic and very convincingly painted work of art and oil painting by a Dutch painter of 17th century. Now, it is very easy for us to feel 
to have a tactile sensation, to feel the touch quality, to also feel the depth in the painting, to feel the three dimensionality, to feel the light that is falling on the objects to shade. In other words, when you look at a painting like this, you have this illusion as if you are looking at a real space with all the three dimensional qualities. But the truth is what you are looking at is a flat space. It is a flat canvas on which a still life has been painted, but evoking certain qualities using certain principles of visual perception which will compel us to conceive this painting as an extension of real space, thereby creating an illusion of real space. No wonder that this kind of paintings have been called illusionistic paintings. This kind of language of communication has been called illusionistic language. Or look at this one where you have the space, the depth of an entire room with objects, furnitures, two figures placed within the painting. Now, looking at this three dimensional quality of the painting or the illusion that is created thereby, we cannot really say that these objects like chairs and furniture and figures have been placed on the painting, they have been placed inside the painting. There is a sense of inside and interior, a three dimensional depth within the painting whereas in reality this painting is nothing but a flat surface, it is an illusion. So, even a highly realistic painting like this, like this is actually an illusion created by the artist by using certain principles of visual perception. Now, it is in this context that uh, we should have a quick look at what is known as gestalt theory or gestalt principles of visual perception. Now, there are many principles and many aspects of gestalt theory, we shall pick up a few and explore them. And the theory, gestalt theory originally came about in the 1890s to give you a brief historical background and gestalt in German uh, means shape, form, likeness. There are three main gestalt psychologists like Max Wertheimer who is credited as the founder of the movement of gestalt psychology, Wolfgang Kohler and Kurt Kofka. The concept of gestalt psychology was originally founded by an Austrian psychologist called Christian Freiherr von Enfels. Now, gestalt principles are fairly simple and it is something that we experience in our daily life quite frequently and they can be split into three groups. First, figure ground relationship, second similarity, proximity, common fate and good continuity and thirdly closure, area and symmetry. Now, in the figure ground relationship, we often find a possibility of reversibility. For example, in this drawing, figure and ground is explained that how we put different elements together to make one scene or a whole image. Figure usually is the more dominant shape, whereas ground can be referred to as the background. But in this diagram, you can see uh, either a goblet on a black background or a black silhouetted profile on a white background. It all depends on what you want to see, where you want to focus on. So, once you have identified the figure, the rest of the image becomes the ground. It can be the goblet or it can be the two profiles. So, the possibility keeps unfolding itself. It is a very simple diagram, but when an artist uses this principle in his or her painting, the scope of communication, visual communication keeps expanding itself. For example, in this drawing, the figure ground relation can be affected by the principle of smallness. Smaller areas tend to be seen as figures against a larger background. 
and again you can have this illusion or this ambiguity or this riddle where it is up to you to identify a form and treat the rest as a background and it can keep reversing one from the other. Now, when we have similar objects of size, shape and color again we form groups. It can be a grouping by color like the diagram on the left hand side or it can be grouping by shapes like the diagram on the right hand uh, image. Now, what is happening here is that these possibilities of how our mind or brain works in the context of visual perception is uh, used very carefully and very intelligently by many artists. In any case in our subsequent lectures when we will be looking at various examples across the cultures we shall see that intentionally or not deliberately or not artists all over the world have always been using certain principles to make the visual communication effective. For example, op artists in the west in the context of modern western art utilized these principles to create their artworks. Expectations, assumptions and tendencies play a very significant role in visual perception and by the same token in art. When you look at the close up of a terracotta relief panel from a terracotta temple in Bengal and how do we know that these are window shutters through which a figure or a head is peeping out. Because you connect these forms, these lines, these elements with what you know. So, visual principle is not just about what you are receiving at that moment, it is also about what you have already received in the past. It has got something to do with your knowledge, with your memory. So, when you look at this detail of a Bengal terracotta temple, a small little panel, in most cases nobody will make the mistake of identifying these horizontal lines as something else because of the way the head is peeping out from inside, because of the way the horizontal lines have been carved in the soft clay panel, we can immediately identify them as window shutters or Venetian blinds, which at one point of time was very common in Indian household. Or for that matter, when you look at this uh, print uh, um, which depicts a landscape, but the depiction does not have lot of details, mostly it is suggestive with lot of textures and marks, but because of your knowledge, because of your ability to connect this imagery with the real land, real landscape, real life you are able to identify each and every object in this drawing perfectly. In our real life, the process of visual perception actually helps us to identify objects from our knowledge to a great extent. And knowledge is also required in art in order to identify not only the objects, but also the emotion, also the feeling also the psychological content embedded within a given work of art. And that is why incredible power of mental suggestion enables our visual perception not only to receive and interpret visual data, but also to imagine and feel. So, that is one of the reasons why when you look at this small little sculpture of a bull head made by Picasso, even before you recognize the horn as a cycle handle bar or the face of the bull as nothing but the cycle seat, you actually identify the whole as a bull's head. It is only later when you try to figure out the elements that you notice that it is actually 
a combination between a cycle set and a handlebar. But then because of a very perfect combination your brain despite the knowledge that these two elements have nothing to do with the real bull, but they are parts of a bicycle. It does not matter for the brain because the brain has already begun identifying this object as the head of a bull. So, and this has been used very very intelligently by Picasso in this work of art or in this painting by Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore very near abstract shapes thus tend to assume human forms with very very limited suggestions. Now, look at this work where you can see it is a page of an illustrated book meant for children. Even if you do not know the story you can see the figure of a human being placed right at the center bottom center of the page and placed in a very stable way. In the very next image you see that same person almost cut through the edge the left hand edge of the paper and it immediately gives you a feeling as if the figure is walking out of the page walking away from the center and going out of the page just by using the positioning of a figure in a given space without introducing any other detail the artist very successfully is able to suggest that in the left hand drawing the human figure the character is still there very stable whereas on the right hand drawing he is simply about to leave the stage. He does not say anything there is no literary text on the work it is the matter of visual communication using certain visual codes using the principles of visual perception that the artist is able to communicate the content very intelligently. So, that is why even if you do not know exactly the story just by looking at the position of the figures you can sim immediately feel that it is about a very violent fight that is going on above the ground or maybe on a ground far away from the foreground in this particular painting referring to an Indian mythological story. And once again we go back to this painting which we have already seen in our previous lecture and uh, we have already got this sense that because these figures have been pushed towards the right hand side of the painting a little bit of blank space on the left hand side of the painting does not look really blank it actually evokes a feeling that there is something outside the painting more important than what is happening inside the painting. And now when we look at the trumpets now when we look at the way the people are blowing the trumpets give us a feeling that somebody probably a king is being welcomed by these people and that king is yet to come into the frame he is still outside the frame. So, certain kind of visual principles can be very useful also to suggest not only what is happening within the frame, but also what is happening outside the frame. Now, so larger circle for example, is said usually to be moving uh, kind of uh, the, the foreground and the smaller circles is apparently uh, kind of uh, recedes uh, in the background and similarly the lower circle is supposed to move whereas, uh, to, to, uh, to down on the ground and the foreground whereas, the higher circle is supposed to be receding into the background. So, positioning of very simple shapes like circles and how far they are located from each other can always tell you something about their activity about their fate common fate. So, obviously the process of visual perception is very physical eyes are focusing on objects rods and cones are processing the matter and optic nerves are transporting the images they have recorded. The history of theories of perception shows that the writers and thinkers of the past two and a half millennia have experienced a surprising degree of agreement about the physicality and the tangible quality of the process of perception. They have of course, 
differed on how this process works. Not only does the brain make up or construct what it sees, but it is also liable to be fooled by what is seen. In fact, most of the artists across the world have explored and utilized this possibility. But someone like Escher, M. C. Escher from Netherlands made it kind of his lifelong artistic project that how to deal, how to demonstrate these possibilities of illusions which is a part of our visual perception process and our next lecture will be on that. Thank you.